So this weekend, uh, I'm excited because, again, like as we talked last Sunday on Palm Sunday, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and they threw down their cloaks, and they threw down uh, palm branches, and they waved palm branches because they believed that hope had come, that peace had come. We walked through that, the same people who were declaring and shouting, Hosanna, Messiah, the anointed one, were the very same people later on in the week that were yelling, crucify him. This was a significant week. I pray that you paused and you didn't just go through the week as usual, just working the normal grind of that nine to five, but this week is a significant week in who we are as Christians and believers. On Thursday of that week, Jesus was arrested, and then on Friday, what was a terrible day for Jesus called Good Friday was an amazing day for us because Jesus didn't just take on sin and struggle and all your issues. Come on, how many of y'all know you got some issues? Say amen. <laughs> but he not only took it on, but he actually became all of it. Your past struggles, the stuff you're compartmentalizing and dealing with now, and stuff that you'll deal with in the future, Jesus ultimately hung on the cross for you because he said you were valuable. Because he said you were worth it. Not overlooked or damaged goods or fragile. He saw you on the cross, and we're gonna unpack that today because Easter is so much more than Cadbury bunnies. Hey, hey man, how many of y'all love the Cadbury bunnies? Come on. It's so much more than those peeps. How many of you guys eat the peeps? Like, and we literally have no idea what's in them. Decoupage, formaldehyde, super glue, yellow number six, and marshmallow with goodness. And now they've come out with so many different ones, and I'm just like, whoa, but we. That, there's so much more. Easter is so much more than Easter egg hunts and people dressed up in rabbit costumes. All of that is fun. It's family friendly. But Easter is so significant because on that Friday that Jesus died, there was this break in between on Saturday where his disciples and the people that followed him were like, is he really gonna rise up from the grave like he said? Saturday was silent, but it was also a setup. Because on Sunday, three days after he was crucified, y'all, he came up out of the grave and resurrection power hit the earth and everything began to shift. So in Matthew chapter 20, if you're taking down notes, verse 17 through 19, Jesus made his way into the city of Jerusalem. He actually predicted his own death. As Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and talked to them about what would happen when they arrived. He said, I will be betrayed to the chief priests and other Jewish leaders. They will condemn me to die. They'll hand me over to the Roman government. I'll be mocked and I'll be crucified, but on the third day. Come on, somebody say the third day. He said, I will rise to life again. The resurrection of Jesus remains a complete game-changing moment. It really did change everything. How did Jesus take 12 misfits that he called his disciples? These guys are fishermen and tax collectors and farmers. And they ended up multiplying where now one out of every three people on this planet identify themselves as a Christian. They say there's over 2.5 billion Christians worldwide. It literally shifted everything. It split our calendar from AD into BC. It's absolutely amazing because no other event on planet Earth has ever impacted the world as much as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love this, some uh, interesting facts about Jesus, historical facts, some Bible theologians and professors put these facts together. Uh, number one, Jesus never wrote a book, yet there are more books written about Jesus than any subject in the world. It's amazing. Number two, Jesus never wrote any music or songs, but there has been more music written about Jesus than any other subject. Literally thousands upon thousands of songs have been written about him. Number three, there aren't any verses that talk about Jesus drawing or, uh, uh, or doing any kind of art sculpture. I mean, he had the moment where he drew in the sand when the woman was caught in adultery and nobody really knows what he was writing in the sand. Some Bible theologians believe as he was writing in the sand because he was saying, hey, there's all these accusers. But some say that when he crouched down and was writing, he was writing the people that were throwing uh, accusations and wanting to cast stones at her, that people believe that he was writing their name down. Like, oh, you think she's messy? How about you, Brent? Write your name in the sand. <laughs> There's more sculptures around the subject of Jesus than any other 
subject in history. And number four, this is really fascinating. The region Jesus ministered was never more than 100 miles from where he was born, yet followers are found literally all over the planet because when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the atmosphere shifted and everything changed. How many of y'all are grateful for the price that he paid? Come on, you can make some noise, it's okay. Christianity is spread all over the world, and it's not just okay news, it's not just decent news. The gospel is called good news, but y'all, it's really, really great news. Look at the person next to you and say, it's really great news. Come on. Christianity, or to be a Christian, which I'll give you an opportunity later, is not a religious moment. It's not just about rules and regulations, and it's not about a legalistic approach. God is not looking for perfection, but he is looking for your heart. And here at Hope City, you can belong even before you believe. But what we know is the closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll realize, I don't really need to live this way. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll realize the things that once drew you in, that enticed you, that pulled you away like a moth to a flame, you'll realize there's a better way. So we're gonna unpack that a little bit more, but to be a Christian literally means to be Christ-like, and the truth is, it belongs to all of us. We all have access to this life. So shifting gears for a moment, every morning I wake up in proximity to a gift. Some of y'all are like, I know, your beautiful wife, Kim Possible, okay. <laughs> and I feel a little nervous actually saying the rest of this because I was actually talking about our Peloton bike. Um, <laughs> if you don't know what a Peloton bike is, it's an engineered masterpiece that I bought for my wife that has a huge footprint in our room. And uh, the truth is we, we both have access to this bike, but only one of us use it. <laughs> Sits in that room, and at first I thought it was overrated, but I'm actually starting to see results. She has, she has biceps now, uh, <laughs> and I have these. <laughs> I was born without muscle mass. Uh, but this bike is in our room, and the truth is when she sees the bike, she sees progress. When I see it, I see pain. <laughs> I'm just not interested in it. When she sees it, she gets on that bike and rides upwards of 90 minutes. How many of y'all have a Peloton? Like, you like a Peloton? Like, you're into Peloton? There's a bunch of you. Okay. Oh, she sells them. Wow. We have a rep right here on the second row. She's like, I sell them. I said, at Carrie Jameson. Instagram. That's amazing. So when I bought my wife her Peloton, Peloton actually reached out and said, hey, you're within the window. We have the new Peloton Plus. We want to upgrade you. How many of y'all like the upgrades? And so they upgraded us for nothing. It was incredible. So we ended up getting this. And so when she rides, she's like Lance Armstrong with the Tour de France. When I have ridden, mine's a little bit more like a Mary Poppins pace. Like I'll yell to one of my kids, like, bring me gelato, because I'm riding through the streets of Italy. So what's the point of all this? Some of you are like, this is Easter? What's happening right now? The point is, I just think it's interesting how two people can have the same proximity to something, but their value can differ so greatly. We have this incredible gift, the gift of Jesus, and the dilemma is similar, that is Jesus a man that I'm gonna choose to follow, or am I gonna flee from? Because again, all of us have access to this incredible gift. We're in proximity to the one who sees us, who knows us, who wants a relationship with us, yet some will choose to follow and some will choose to go it alone. I've said this before, if you're here at Hope City and you've been here for any amount of time or you're brand new and you showed up because your mom invited you and you're like, it's Easter, I do have to go. The truth is, Jesus is just one mention of his name away from being right there. No matter how far you've strayed, no matter how messed up you've been, no matter how many poor choices you've made, he's one mention of his name away from being right there, your very present help in time of need. The Bible actually says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for everyone, who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord might be saved. It doesn't say that. It says everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, what does it say? Will be saved. Slate wiped clean, failures fixed, access to the breakthrough and restoration that we all need when we call upon the name of Jesus and we surrender our lives to him. So uh, I'm uh, almost 18 years married in July to my beautiful wife. Oh, that's amazing. And if you know my statistics, I'll give you a snapshot of my family journey in a little bit, but uh, to get to a year and to even get past a year is an absolute miracle because I was born in a family where you've got girlfriends on the side. Now, I married a country girl. She'd be like, uh-uh, not today. I'll cut you and club you. Either way, 
But almost 18 years, we have four amazing kids. Brecken's 13. My daughter, Finley, is 11. Brecken's on the front row. Give my boy a hand. He's my oldest. She's my legacy. I've got a five-year-old daughter named Daphne, and then uh, our little dude, his name is Fox. He is three. And then we have a golden doodle named Bella. Uh, how many of you guys are dog people? Let me hear it. Where's all the dog people? Y'all may, you get smiling. And watch, watch this. How many of y'all are cat people? Did you see that? It's about nine people. And they were more like, mm, yeah, sneaky about it. Uh, but there's something about us that when we first started, I was actually a worship pastor. I did music for a long, long time, singer, songwriter. We traveled, did touring, did evangelism and teaching before we were lead pastors. And the truth is, my wife and I love the adventure of life. As we've traveled all around the country, we've loved to experience different cities and new things. And y'all, I'm telling you right now, and I know we have a lot of people watching online, but we love Houston, Texas. Like Houston, Texas is incredible. My wife's roots are here and very little things are as fun as good food. Where's all the foodies at? Like, I mean, I'm telling you, good food. And I read a book or I went through a book at Barnes & Noble, a guy who wrote a book on 365 that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> we went through 365 restaurants in 365 days in, in the city of Houston. Y'all, we have so much diversity and culture, so many incredible restaurants. You never even have to eat at a chain. We can support local. There's a lot of good food. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm hungry. Come on, let them know. Say, I'm hungry. But a couple months ago, I had some friends coming in from out of town, and I told my wife, I was like, I, I love the adventure of creating adventures for friends. So we went to a next level restaurant. Like this place was incredible. And I told him, I said, hey, don't, you may not wanna eat the night before. Don't eat breakfast and lunch. You may wanna fast a whole day because we're gonna go all the way in. Like we're gonna eat, we're gonna order multiple appetizers, seafood tumblers with dry ice where you can't even see each other. Like it's a whole adventure. Like y'all, this was not Chili's. So fun fact, my mom's actually watching online. Give my parents a hand. They're actually watching right now. And every time I say that, she'll text me and say, we are watching. I'm like, I know, Barbara, I just said. But we were in Florida and my mom said, she's like, we're getting hungry. And I was like, well, what time is it? It's three o'clock. She's like, I know, but we've got to get to the restaurant before they do the dinner prices. So we show up, you can't eat. You have to do saltine crackers and water and squeeze the lemons and sweet and low in it. Like that's lemonade. And so my mom's like, let's go eat. And I was like, well, what's our options? We got Luby's. How many of y'all like the, you like Luby's? Okay. But my mom's like, hey, would you like to go to Golden Corral? And I said, I haven't had pink eye in a while. <laughs> it's a true story. They got the chocolate fountain in there. And I was standing there and I was at this crossroads where I'm like, should I eat? Should I dip something in that chocolate? And this little kid walks up to me and he looks right at me. He made eye contact. He didn't break eye. And he grabbed one of the little skewers and he stuck a marshmallow on it. And while he was watching me, he put his put the skewer in and he, he kept going. He extended his entire wrist and arm into the chocolate and he just stared at me. And I was like, get your kid, whose kid is this? And he pulled the chocolate out and the lady behind me was like, I don't know, it's probably purified. I'm like, it's not, it's not purified. A anyways, so I took my friends to this next level restaurant and y'all, we went all the way in. I mean, we got so many amazing things. We ordered multiple desserts and multiple appetizers and then something hit me about midway through when I started tallying up the total. And then I started thinking, well, I mean, are they really that good of friends? Like we could split the tab. You know what I mean? Like how well do I really know these guys? And so, uh, but I budgeted for it. I told my wife, I was like, we're going to budget for this. And, uh, I might have to eat hot pockets for the next few weeks, but we're going to have an adventure. And then towards the end of the meal, the waiter came over and, and he said, uh, Hey, uh, can I get you guys anything else? And I said, just one ticket. Give it to that guy. <laughs> and he said, actually, sir, I, I was wanting you to, you to know that uh, someone actually paid for your entire meal. And I said, what? He said, your entire meal has been covered. And my response was disbelief because, again, I knew how much this had cost. I knew how much we had ordered. And so I started kind of pressing for clarity. And I said, when you say taken care of, like to be clear. He said, yeah, from the appetizers to the entrees, to the seafood dishes, to the desserts, and even a generous tip. I said, amen. Like, <laughs> this is incredible. But it's a moment like this, was, it was a little uncomfortable. And so I'm, I'm pressing for clarity because I'm trying to figure out like, some of y'all like, why are you pressing for so much clarity? Like you could have gotten more items to go. Like, 
somebody blessed you. Take the blessing and leave. Like, but in that moment, that moment could have gone two ways. Because I could have handled it like, this is my meal. Like, I chose to eat here. I don't need any handouts. I'm a grown man. I can pay for my own stuff. But instead, because I knew that we had gotten carried away, I decided to choose the gift with only one condition. I asked the waiter, can I at least know who paid for my meal? And he's like, that guy over there. This guy was over there, and he was like, like he was at an auction. And I went over, and I shook his hand, and I said, hey, th thank, thank you so much. And he said, Daniel, you don't know me, but I know you. It's a true story. He said, and this isn't actually a one-time thing. I've seen you in and out of here before. I'm actually around here a lot. And if you'll come through here, I'll, I'll actually cover future meals as well. If you'll come around here, I'll actually bless you in the future as well. And I was faced with two choices. Is my priority the gift or the gift giver? Because I could have taken the gift and thought, man, I hit the jackpot. Like, hey, do you know of any other restaurants around here? Because there's some nicer ones down <laughs> Have you been to Vegas? Like, there's all kinds of good restaurants. I could have approached it one of two ways because I knew how much it costs. And I wanted to know why he paid for it. But all of a sudden, I found myself with this opportunity to, again, use his generosity to live it up or maybe take the generosity he showed me and actually think maybe I could get to know this person for a minute and maybe find out his story of why he chose to bless me and take care of me. Why, out of everybody else in this restaurant, he chose to take care of us. Y'all, this is the gospel message. This is the story of Easter, that God loved us so much and he loved you so much that he paid the tab in full. That the grace that's so undeserved, that we do deserve. Where's all my never should have made it's at? Like, you know you never should have made it. Like, that you wake up and take a breath is a miracle. But the truth is, you did wake up and take another breath, which is proof that God's not done with you yet. You've survived 100% of your worst days. Why? Because his grace and his mercy has paid your tab in full. And maybe you're hearing you say, Daniel, you don't know my past. You don't know the mistakes I've made. The truth is sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and will cost you way more than you want to spend. But I have great news for you on this Easter weekend at Hope City. There is grace for every goof up. There is mercy for every mistake. God's not mad at you, but he's actually madly in love with you. Your past, your past issues, your worst sins can be totally erased because he paid the tab in full. Come on, say it's paid in full. The truth is, if you're taking down notes, you can write this down. Everyone can be fully set free and forgiven because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Everyone, anybody, everybody can be fully set free and forgiven because of Jesus' death and resurrection. John chapter three, verse 16 says, for God so loved the world, so much that he gave his only son so that anyone, say anyone, who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There is forgiveness from Jesus' sacrifice for us. Our part is simply surrender. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, I'm grateful for the grace, the undeserved grace of Jesus. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. It's a lot of scriptures, but I need you to grab this. Let us then with confidence draw near. That's a choice. That's a choice to position yourself and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. How many of you guys need some mercy? You need some grace in that time of need? And I wanna say this. I've said this multiple times, but if there's any area of your life that has no hope. It's been under the influence of a lie because hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And he's here fighting for you, standing with you and wants to heal your entire life. Maybe this year you walked in to one of our campuses or you're watching online and you do this Easter thing out of ritual and routine. Like you show up on Christmas Eve for your mama, you show up on Easter to check a box but what we're believing for is that the same grace we're talking about from the word, you'll experience yourself. Ephesians chapter four, verse seven, because it belongs to you. It says, but grace was given to each one of us. That has nothing to do with status, how much money you do or don't have, how accomplished you are with degrees, what your skin color is. It has nothing to do with it. It's for every one of us. That's why I love the diversity of our church. That's why I love a church that looks like heaven. That's why we teach our kids to not say that we're colorblind. Because I want my kids to see color because Genesis 1:27 says that God shaped and molded us in his image. 
And I want them to see the beauty in the design of God's creation. It belongs to all of us. Say, it belongs to me. I need you to grab that. It belongs to you. So my family story briefly, if you've been in at Hope City any amount of time, you've probably heard my story before I was born in an accident into a pretty messed up, addicted, filled home for drugs and alcohol. Maybe that's some of your story. My dad struggled with being faithful to my mom, and my mom didn't really know if there was a God, higher power, big man upstairs, and she gets pregnant with her third, and the doctor's like, hey, I'm recommending something. I think you should probably get an abortion. It's difficult enough for you to raise these other two kids, let alone bring another baby into this world. My mom said she couldn't, she couldn't really articulate what she was feeling other than there must be a purpose behind this baby, even though in the natural, it's an accident. So my dad said, you need to make the appointment. My mom kept telling him, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. She said, I'm going to go. And she was trying to wait out the timeline of saying, oh, I'm so sorry. So some of y'all are like, what happened? Why well, I made it. I'm not a hologram. Like, I'm here. I'm on the stage. I'm standing here in front of you. My mom felt this conviction. She felt this overshadowing peace and love, and she ended up having me, and she was raising my brother, my sister, and me like a single mom because my dad was in and out and never really around, and my mom ends up getting ministered to by a lady at a Kroger in Grove City, Ohio, and the lady walked up and began to talk to my mom about Jesus. Thank God for people that still talk about Jesus, and invited my mom to church. Now, people like us don't go to church, so we go to this little church with no air conditioning in Commercial Point, Ohio, and we begin to go every week. There's an old saying that says a church alive is worth the drive, man. We would show up every week, and as I grew up in this church, they'd put me up on a stool, and I'd sing, amazing grace, how sweet that sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Now, I was husky and I was little, so I, it was more like amazing grace. But anyways, you get the point. You get the point. You understand. And my mom would take us weekly because she experienced the grace of God. Not religion, but the person of Jesus. Throughout the craziness, my mom continued to believe and pray that my dad would come to know the Lord. My dad showed up to church one Sunday a guy walked up to him in the parking lot and said, hey, what's your name? My dad told him. He said, this is my name. He said, listen, I got a seat for you in here. My dad said, you have a seat for me? He said, yeah, we were waiting for you. He said, you knew I was coming? Like, who told you? <laughs> my dad, again, showed up, strung out, struggling, full of addiction. But now, 40 years later, my dad has never sipped another sip of alcohol. He stopped using, shooting up, drinking, beating people up, cheating on my mom. Everything changed with one encounter with Jesus. Some of y'all are in the room right now and you're like, I need an encounter like that. I need my husband or my wife or my son or my daughter to have an encounter like that. And the truth is we all come to this crossroads because that day the pastor preached a really simple message on the grace of God. And the question that we all often have is, well, man, this grace seems like it just kind of lets us off the hook for our stuff. And if grace is so good, then why can't I just live the way I want? That's deeply ingrained in humanity, leading thousands of years back. Paul even talked about it in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He said, well, then, should we just keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. I love that shift right there. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Because here's the truth. Grace isn't a license to sin. It's a license from sin. There's a better way moving forward. There's a better way than just spending our lives on this earth, spending more than we can afford like consumers, constantly using the grace to do what we want. Or we could lean in and recognize there's a Savior named Jesus who wants a relationship with us. He chooses us. He chooses to love us. And not only does he choose to love you, he actually likes you. Because we struggle with that in humanity. We're like, I love that dude. I don't like that guy very much. He not only loves you, but he likes you and desires a relationship with you. So you can choose to kind of go it your own way, or you can choose to get closer to the one who paid for it all. Pastor Daniel, maybe you're here today and you're like, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth, though. You don't know the things I've done. 
He's talking about grace. He's talking about mercy, but I'm super messed up. I got super messy past. Maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you grew up in a great Christian family. You only watched Fireproof, Left Behind, and Kirk Cameron films and listened to Casting Crowns. That, that might be your story. Or maybe you're the opposite, and maybe my story connected more with you. Like, yeah, I got some stuff. Jesus says in Luke chapter 15, he tells about this parable about how the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. He'll never, re he'll never reject you. He'll, he'll never reject you. He'll accept you as a daughter and a son, no matter how super glued and duct taped back together your life may feel. The Bible says in John 3, verse 17, for God did not send the son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world. No, no, he, 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 but he came to the world that you would find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. And again, this is the gospel story that God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son Jesus was born of a virgin named Mary to come to earth to live among us, to experience life as both man and God, yet to know no sin, to be led like a lamb to slaughter so upon his shoulders our sin and shame might be carried. But oftentimes maybe you say, man, my argument is not that I'm so sinful, but maybe it's, but all this seems too easy. I don't buy it. Like I came because my mom invited me, but I don't know. I don't know that I buy all of this. This is a little too good to be true because everything in my life, Daniel, has proven to be difficult. I've had to work for everything. To the person that might have that thought, you're right. This grace is way too easy because it costs so much. Jesus makes his way carrying the cross towards Calvary, mocked and wrongfully accused, yet willing to take it on and become Sin for all of humanity hung between two thieves who were guilty and he himself is not guilty yet took the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet because he said you were valuable because he said you were worth it. Never overlooking you. So the other day I was at my office and I grabbed my backpack. I'm a backpack guy and it's like you kind of differ. Like there are people that are like cilantro people. I said it earlier, there's dog and cat people. I'm a backpack guy. And there's people that are briefcase people. Now I'm not going to focus too much on the briefcase because the truth is, if you're a briefcase person, statistically, you have a higher net worth than me and you're going home. You're fine. Like, you're good. <laughs> I'm a backpack guy because the truth is, I feel like it carries weight better for me. I'm my friend Josh come out. Can you give it up for Josh as he comes out real quick? And the reason, again, I prefer a backpack to a briefcase is because of the weight that's being carried in the backpack. And there's multiple ways you can carry it. Josh can carry it this way. He can also yeah, do this. This is super awkward. This is the social distancing stance. But, but this, you can hear it this way. And for some, you could probably do that for a minute and a half to two minutes, but then Josh is like, oh man, my arm's starting to burn. He could put it up on his shoulder. That's another way you can carry it. They say statistically, you can carry it this way for 30 minutes to an hour, or you can use it in the way the function of a backpack should be used, and that's fully on your back. They say statistically, people can carry a backpack like that for six to eight hours. For a moment, I want you to envision that in this backpack is all of your sin, all of the weight of the things that you've done, things that you maybe had done to you, shame and condemnation and lies that you've believed and they've even increased throughout the years. But throughout the years, you've gotten a little wiser. Maybe you've learned to carry the weight better. You've redistributed the weight so it, it hurts less, but you still feel it because the thing about this backpack is you never put it down. Because if you set it down, someone might see the mistakes you've made. Someone might dig through it and see the scars that you carry. And maybe you carry it and you're like, yeah, but the truth is I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to keep it close to vest because this is my story, man. But the truth is, by carrying this weight yourself, it's way too heavy. You carry it the best you can, but you realize the mistakes you've made are too heavy. But along comes Jesus. And he's like, hey, would you give the weight to me? Because you can live and you can breathe and you can function. But with this backpack on, it's diminished. You, you don't walk into certain rooms because there's no room for you and your baggage. You don't sit at certain tables and make certain connections because it's too bulky to sit down and stay a while. You don't go swimming because you'll sink to the bottom and you won't be able to swim. You, you don't sleep well at night because it's so awkward because you're carrying the heaviness that never belonged to you. And here's the truth, and I believe this is gonna help somebody. There's a destiny and dreams that you're missing out on because of the weight that you've been carrying. 
dreams that are unfulfilled. Why? Because of the weight that you've chose to carry. Relationships that are in pieces, connections not made because of the weight that you've chosen to carry. Breakthrough that you've never experienced because of the weight that you're choosing to carry. Peace you've missed out on because of the weight that you've been carrying. Clarity forfeited. Why? Because the weight you've been carrying. And when you've done everything you can do to redistribute and shift the weight and move it all around, all of a sudden it's abundantly evident that your best is just not enough. You can say, well, you know what? I'm going to go to a counselor then. They can, they can take it from me. And listen, we're pro-counseling here. My wife is brilliant. She has her master's degree in counseling. We are pro-counseling. But here's the truth. Your counselor can share the weight, but they can't take it from you. Your best friend, I got somebody in my corner, Pastor D, that I know can help me take this weight. Well, your good friend can help shoulder some of that weight and help carry that weight for a moment, but they can't take the weight from you. Your spouse, the one that you're going to spend the rest of your life with, is like, hey, I'm here for you. I've got you. I wake up early. I'm speaking life over you. I pray verses over you. And for a while, I can help you lift the weight Shoulder some of that weight, but I cannot take it from you. At Hope City, my wife said it earlier, we're a church large enough to serve a city, but our connect groups make us small enough to know you. Maybe you're like, hey, I got a connect group, and they're amazing. I got my band of brothers and sisters. We do life together. We go to Top Golf and Andretti's. We go and eat good food. And the truth is, for a while, they can even help sustain you for a season and help take some of the weight off, but the truth is they're not even designed to take it from you. As your pastor, maybe you're at one of our other campuses and your campus pastors are there. I can speak life into you. I can even pray for you. I can even help you for a season, but the truth is I'm not God. I can't carry this weight that you're refusing to let go of because the truth is there's only one person that is able to not redistribute the weight but to completely remove it. And that one is Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, that we are to cast all of our cares on the Lord, all of our concerns, all of our worries, all of our anxieties once and for all, because he was and always has been designed to not only carry it, but remove it and take it from you. Come on, somebody give God praise. Hmm. Because the answer begins with and ends with Jesus. When I see Jesus all throughout the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in these books, we see a God who has the strength to carry, who knows your past and your future, and again, yet he still chooses you. This is the Easter story. He was beaten. He endured a brutal punishment deserved by us for us. But Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Close your eyes for just a moment. Again, when I see Jesus, I see him carrying the weight of the cross while thinking about the lightness and spirit that would be available through this moment. I see him bound in place with nails because he had vision of us walking free. I see him raised up, mocked and scorned so that we could walk blameless and delivered. And when he went to the grave, he was intent on not just carrying, but bearing our sins so that in the courtroom of heaven, the enemy has no evidence of any wrongdoing over any of us any longer. But then on the third day, when the sin and shame and the weight of the world was carried into the pit, Jesus was raised to life, reigning in victory, shining in splendor, standing with power so that although we were once hopeless in our sin, we can be raised to life again with him. Because when I see Jesus, I see a king who rules over heaven and over earth, who stops at nothing to love us at our worst. The multitude singing out. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world, there's freedom in his name. Would you stand to your feet and say, his name is Jesus, his name is Jesus, light of the world, 
this prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world. Come on, will you lift your hands towards heaven in a sign of surrender? One more time, say, say, his name is Jesus. I was told by a friend a story about a man who was caught up in a dream and he was in heaven. He came face to face with Jesus. Facing accusation, Jesus said to him, give it back. I paid for it. I know you have it, it's mine and I want it back. The man in disbelief said, Lord, you know me. I've never taken anything from you. Jesus replied more sternly, I bought it, but you took it like it belongs to you. I give it back. The man now fearful and brought to tears said, Lord, can you just give me some more insight? What have I stolen? What have I taken from you? To which Jesus replied, give me the shame. Give me the hurt. Give me all the anger, the unrest. Give me your anxiety and depression. Give me all that fear, all your worries. Give me the weight that I died for, it's not yours anymore. Now give it back, it's mine. I died, I was buried, and I rose again on the third day for you to not have to carry it any longer. And maybe you're here today, and maybe a relationship with Christ is a brand new experience, and maybe something in your heart has been convincing you of the fact that there's more to life than the way you've been living, or maybe you used to walk with Jesus and you got caught up in the prodigal life and you started living reckless and living for you. Maybe you've dug up old condemnation throughout the years. The truth is when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we get to have God's spirit living inside of us. Everything changes when we surrender our life. When we spiritually lean in, it's like being born again all over again. Galatians chapter two, verse 20 says, my old self has been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So that I live in this earthly body, but trusting in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Your old man gone, old issues, old struggles, all fixed, all healed, all forgiven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he died for our sins and rose again. Why? To make us right with God filling us with God's goodness. With your eyes closed just for a moment. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online, you're like, Daniel, here's the truth. I, I don't know Jesus like you're talking about. I've only known about him, but I wanna know him. Again, this isn't a religious encounter. We don't pray prayers at Hope City for ritual or routine or just to pray prayers to pray them. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse nine and 10, to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, or maybe you're the second part and you're like, Daniel, the truth is I used to walk with him, but today's my day. I want to rededicate my life this Easter weekend. Today is my day on the 17th of April, 2022, that I want to reconnect in relationship with Jesus. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. We will not embarrass you here at Hope City. This is a moment between you and God, but I do at the count of three, want you to boldly lift up your hand and say, today's my day that I want to surrender my life for the first time I want to rededicate my life. One, today's my day, Daniel. The truth is, when we lean into the presence of God and we surrender our life, everything changes. He's writing victory in your story. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Today's my day. I want to surrender or rededicate. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see hands going up. Keep them up, keep them up. Hand, hand, hand. I see all your hands, hand here. Hand, hand, hand. Hands over here. I see you back here, my friend here. Family over here, all the way in the back. I see you, my friend. I see you, my friend. I see you back there. I see you, I see you back here. Come on, somebody, let's give it up for all my family and all of our friends that just said, today's my day. Now look at me, look at me. We're about to pray. All of us are about to pray. If you're watching online, say yes to Jesus. Our team, our moderators will help you. But the truth is, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, the icing on the cake this Easter weekend 
that we can be confident of is that we will have a future in heaven. When you lean into the presence of God, when you surrender your life to him, we have a confidence that we will have a future in heaven. Will you pray this prayer with me? Everybody listening in the room, watching online, our whole team, say this out loud. Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it's not working. From today on, I choose to live for you. I repent of all my sins, all my struggles, and all my issues. I'm asking for your forgiveness, and I'm grateful for your faithfulness. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise? Let's go.